lesson to everyone. Today, we are going to discuss Unit 1 and Unit 2, Module 5, for the subject CE4111, Highway and Railroad Engineering. So, in this lecture, we are going to discuss the concept of pavement design for both flexible and rigid pavements. So, before we discuss the pavement design, let us have an overview of the Philippine Road Network. So as of October 2019, from the data of the Department of Public Works and Highway, the Philippines has a total road length of 216,387 kilometers, in which 61,093 kilometers are already paved. In this case, we can see that only 28.23% of the total road length of the country is paved, in which for the total road length, this will now be consisting of provincial roads with length of 31,620, city and municipal roads of 1,950 kilometers length, 121,702 kilometers would be barangay roads and the remaining length of 33,018.25 kilometers will consist of the national roads. So this would include our primary, secondary, and tertiary roads in the Philippines. So if we're going to observe most probably, in the 61,093 kilometers that is paved in our road network, most likely the national road is already included in this number. So for the national road, we are going to take a look on the data. 21,646.1 kilometers is already concreted or paved with concrete and 10,440.98 kilometers is an asphalt road which consists now of our paved roads. For unpaved roads, this would now consist of 41.96 kilometers earth material or soil material and the remaining length of the national road 889.21 kilometers is made up of gravel. So this data is the latest that we could get from the DPWH, which is from 2019. So graphically speaking, if we're going to look on these values, our road length basically consists most of barangay roads at 65%, and for our provincial and national roads, would contribute to 17% both of the total length in our Philippine road network. And looking on our national road, we could already see that for the national road, we have already almost 100% of the national road length as paved with a little remaining length of earth and gravel. So basically, in terms of the national road length, medyo okay na tayo pagdating sa paving of the roads, but for the entirety of the total road length of our network, medyo malayo-layo pa yung ating hahabulin. Okay? So a pavement is a hard surface that would be made of durable surface material and is laid down on the roadway or in the area which we are intended or in, we intend to carry vehicular or foot traffic. Its main function would be to distribute applied vehicle loads or traffic load to subgrade through the different layers. 
its goal is to reduce the vehicle transmitted load so that it will not exceed the burning capacity of the subgrid. The pavement would usually be the costliest items which is associated with highway construction and maintenance. So if we remember from our overview of the road network in the Philippines, about 70% of the roads are not unpaved or not paved. So when we say not paved or unpaved roads, these roads would basically be either composed or made up of gravel, soil, or stabilized materials such as aggregates with cementing agents like your Portland cement, lime fly ash, or asphaltic cement. Highways that would carry high volumes of traffic with heavy axle loads such as your trucks or trailer trucks would require surfaces that will be covered with either asphalt concrete or Portland concrete. This is to provide all-weather operations and prevent permanent deformation on the surface. So basically, Kung hindi masyadong ginagamit yung kalsada or yung road o kaya konti lang, mabigat lang yung dinadala ng road natin, we could consider not paving the road. But if that road now will carry bulky axle load or bulky vehicles and it will be used almost all of the time, then we have to pave our road in order to have a good quality of ride or transportation, a quality skid resistance, and possibly a low noise pollution. <clears throat> so for pavements, there are there is typically or generally two types of pavement that is the flexible pavement and the rigid pavements. We also have a third type which is what we call composite pavements which is simply a combination of the flexible and rigid layers of the two types of pavement. So an example of this would be the continuously reinforced pavements and post tension pavements. So, in our topic or in our lecture, we are only be focusing on the main or the general pavement type, which is the flexible and rigid pavements. So, for flexible pavements, these are pavements that would be constructed with asphaltic cement and aggregates. Okay. So a flexible pavement would now be consisting of several layers and those layers now will include the subgrid or the existing soil, the subbase, the base, and the asphalt pavement or the upper layer made up of asphaltic cement. So for each layer, they will have different thickness wherein for the asphalt pavement or your wearing surface, this will be ranging from 2 to 4 inches. For the base, it will have thickness of 4 to 10 inches. And for the sub-base, will be 4 to 10 inches as well. So for the different layers of a flexible pavement, the, for the first layer, the subgrade, which is the existing uh, soil in which we are going to lay out our roadway, the upper 6 to 8 inches will be scarified. So when we say scarified, it is like scraping it in order to remove debris on the surface in order to blend and provide uniform material before compaction of 
the layer to achieve maximum density. The next layer or level will be the subbase, which will usually be consisting of crushed aggregates. In the crush aggregate that we are going to put above the subgrid should have a better engineering property compared to the subgrid, meaning it should have higher bearing capacity compared to your existing soil. For the next layer, we have the base, which is often made of crush aggregates, which again is of higher strength or higher bearing capacity than that of the sub base. So we cannot put a top layer or over top layer, which will have a lesser strength or lesser capacity than the layer below it. So the base now will be made up of, together with crash aggregates, will be made up of unstabilized or stabilized cementing material. So this cementing material now will include your Portland cement, lime fly ash, or your asphaltic cement. And lastly, we have the wearing surface or your asphalt pavement which will be made up of a mixture of the asphalt and concrete together with some of your aggregates. So the wearing surface now is that surface in which it will carry directly the load of the vehicles. So the purpose now of the wearing surface in a flexible pavement would be to protect the base layer from well abrasion or friction and also to waterproof the entire pavement structure. So as you have learned from your geotechnical engineering that when our soil material will be absorbing water based on its characteristic there is now a chance of erosion, and other engineering failures. So aside from protection, the wearing surface also will provide skid resistance or friction between the surface and the tires so that we will have safe vehicle stops or safe braking. The thickness of each layers the sub base, the base, and the wearing surface or the pavement, asphalt pavement, will now vary depending on the axle load that will pass through your road section or your pavement and the available material in the area and the expected pavement design life for the years in which we expect the pavement to provide service before undergoing major rehabilitation or repair. So next, we have the rigid pavement, which is constructed with port blend cement concrete and aggregates. So same as with flexible pavement, the subgrade of the rigid pavement now will be scarified in order to clear it from debris and blend so that it will blend with the surface to have uniformity before compaction to maximum density. The base layer for rigid pavements is an optional layer which will depend on the engineering property of the subgrade. So if the subgrade, let's say, is has a very low strength, then we could add an additional base layer. Pero kung yung subgrade natin already has a very high strength or very high bearing capacity, then we could not include the base layer for rigid pavements. 
And then for the wearing surface, the wearing surface now will be that of a Portland cement concrete slab. Wherein the slab length will carry from 10 to 13 feet for a spacing of 40 feet or more. Aside from the different layers for rigid pavement, it will also have what we call a transverse contraction joints in which it is built into the pavement so as to control cracking due to shrinkage during the curing process. So as you have learned from your construction materials and testing subject, that when concrete cure, it means it loses water. And when it loses water, there is now a probability of shrinkage, which will also cause cracking in our concrete. So to avoid this, we add up your transverse contraction joints. Aside from this, rigid pavements would also have what we call dowel bars, which are considered as load transfer devices. So from the name itself, or the other name of the dowel bars, it is used now to transfer loads of the vehicle from one slab to another and is placed in the joints of our rigid pavements so as to minimize the flexion and also to reduce stresses near the edges of the slab. So for the slab thickness for your PCC highway pavements or rigid pavements, it will now vary from 8 to 12 inches. So unlike for flexible pavement, which has a thickness for the very top layer of 2 to 4 inches, for rigid pavements, it will now have a very large thickness. Okay? So in terms of the layers, so for your rigid pavement, we have your subgrade or your existing soil. And then we have your subbase. And then we have your concrete slab. So an optional layer can be placed here, which is your base. So for the thickness of our rigid pavements, concrete slab, or your uppermost, your most layer, or the wearing surface, will have a thickness of 8 to 12 inches. Subbase will have a thickness of 4 to 8 inches. And for a section of your pavement, the rigid pavement, the contraction joint now will be along this line, or the connection between the slabs of your pavement. And with in your two slabs, we have what we call your dowels or the load transfer devices. So to compare now flexible and rigid pavements, so again, the most common difference between or most obvious difference between the two are the materials we use in our uppermost layer. So for rigid pavements, it is made out of PCC or Portland cement concrete. And for flexible pavement, it is made up of asphalt concrete. With respect to the layers, rigid pavements will have lesser layers, only its wearing surface, subbase, and the existing soil. While for flexible pavement, we have an additional layer between the uppermost wearing surface and the subbase, which is your base. Likewise, with regards to color, you can see that for a rigid pavement, it is more lighter in color, while for asphalt, it's darker in color. And then with regards to friction, with respect to driver preferences, 
they would pref some drivers would prefer flexible pavement more or asphalt pavement more compared to the rigid pavements. As for rigid pavements, they are somewhat lacking with friction or skid resistance compared to flexible pavements. So, with regards to the transfer of load for flexible and rigid pavements, as we observe or as we can see in the figure, for flexible pavements, the flexible pavement, the distribution of load would basically be higher at the center of the load. While for rigid pavements, the distribution of load would almost somewhat be equal throughout the span of the highway. Okay? Though there's a minim minimum difference of distribution. So for the distribution, the pavement now would reduce and would distribute the contact pressure on acceptable levels of the subgrade. So basically, the uppermost layer, the wearing surface, is there so as to reduce the stresses on the subgrade. Okay? So pag sa rigid pavement, since rigid yung ating uppermost layer, hindi masyadong nai-stress yung subgrade kahit na wala tayong base. Unlike dito sa flexible pavement, dahil mas hindi ganun ka-rigid yung ating wearing surface. Kahit na meron tayong base or another layer just before the subgrade, umaabot pa rin yung ating load transfer doon sa subgrade. Okay? So, that's the difference between flexible and rigid. The distribution of loads on your subgrade. So, for our pavement design, for flexible pavements, there are several design procedures that we accept in designing flexible pavements. We have what we call the Asphalt Institute Method the National Stone Association Procedure, the Shell Procedure, and the AASHTO Flexible Pavement Design Procedure. So in this lecture, what we are going to adopt is the AASHTO Flexible Pavement Design Procedure. So for the AASHTO Procedure, it now follows the serviceability concept in which we have what we call the pavement failure, which will be divided into the engineering perception or point of view, in which uh, in, in the engineering point of view, a pavement fails or is not able to give adequate service when there is now the presence of cracking rotting, and visible surface distress. Aside from the engineering perception, the serviceability concept would also include the public perception or public point of view. So with regards to public use, yung mga gumagamit, the users, they now identify a pavement or a road as non-serviceable when they have a poor ride quality. Okay? So, kahit na walang crack yung sasakyan or yung kalsada, kung hindi maganda yung experience ng road user sa paggamit ng kalsada o ng pavement, the public now or that road user will say that the pavement is already failing. Okay? Pagdating naman sa engineering perception, kahit na maganda yung experience ng public sa kanilang ride quality, pero kung may nakita ng cracking 
doon sa ating payment, it is already considered a failed payment. So, there's already a need for rehabilitation. So, under the AASHTO procedure, the serviceability concept now will be using the AASHTO road test in which it combines the two definitions of failure or serviceability, which is the engineering and the public perception. So, combining now the two, we have what we call the pavement serviceability performance, in which it is defined by the present serviceability index or the PSI, which is the pavement performance at any point in time. And we also have what we call the terminal serviceability index or the TSI, which is when a pavement reaches this TSI, it means that it already needs rehabilitation or repair. Meaning, from the given PSI, it has already dropped its serviceability rating. So, for the serviceability concept, this is applied for both flexible and rigid pavements. So, for our PSI values for new pavements, that would now be from ranging from 4.2 to 4.5. Where in usually for flexible pavements we have 4.2 PSI and for rigid pavements we have usually 4.5. But nevertheless, for both flexible and rigid pavements, it will range from this value 4.2 to 4.5. And then we have for our TSI values, this would now be dependent on the type of highway. So, for highway facilities, the TSI value now will be at 2.5 or 3. And for local roads, we have a TSI value of 2. But normally, we use the midpoint of the minimum and maximum values, TSI of 2.5. So, for the flexible pavement design, we follow the equation wherein it is dependent on what we call the structural number or the thickness index, which is necessary to carry the designated traffic load. So the structural number will be dependent on the thickness of layers. And with that, the flexible pavement design equation will be given by this one. We have log of W18. ZR times S sub O plus 9.36 log of structural number SN plus 1 minus 0.2 plus log of delta PSI divided by 2.7 all over the quantity 0 0.4 plus 1094 over SN plus 1 raised to 5.19 plus 2.32 log of 10 MR minus 8.07. So the variables that would be used for this equation is your W18, which is the equivalent single axle load at 18 kips. ZR is your reliability or the confidence level, which is taken from the Z statistic from your standard normal curve. Then we have your S sub O or the overall standard deviation, your SN, the structural number or thickness index. Then we have your delta PSI or the serviceability loss, which is simply the difference of the initial PSI and your terminal serviceability and index or DSI. And then lastly, we have your M sub R, which is the soil resilient modulus of the subgrade. So for our variables, the equivalent single axle road or ESAL is that load which is converted to an 18 kip which gives 
impact from any axle load. So we convert it. So the impact of the axle load will be converted in terms of an 18T. And then we have your Z sub R, which would represent the probability of serviceability maintained at adequate levels from the user point of view. So it would now estimate the pavement in which it will perform at or above the TSI design line. Usually the ZR is at 90% or higher for interstate highways or sa atin national highway. Pag local roads and then a design, the ZR usually be, will be at 50% from a uh, confident level. And then we have your S sub O, the overall standard deviation, <coughs> which takes into account the designer's inability to accurately estimate the variation in future 18 kip E sag or the future traffic. So S O usually has typical values of 0 0.30 0 0.5. So usually this is given in the problem. And then we have your structural number, SN, which would represent the overall structural requirement required to sustain the design traffic loading. So as I have said, SN now will be dependent on the thickness of the layer thus being called also as the thickness index. And aside from that, it is also dependent on the material we are going to use for each layer of the pavement. Then we have your delta PSI or the serviceability loss, which is caused by the pavement roughness, cracking, patching, and rotting. So again, the delta PSI is simply the difference between your initial PSI and the TSI. So take note that as pavement distress increases, so as we have higher stress, meaning we'll have a lower serviceability. So for delta PSI, if we have heavy traffic loads, we may have a loss of 1.2, while for low volume roads, we have possible losses at 2.7. Okay, so ito yung difference already of the initial PSI and the terminal PSI. <clears throat> so kung walang given na PSI initial and PSI, then if it's a heavy traffic load, automatic we use 1.2 for delta PSI. And if it's a low volume road, we automatically use delta PSI equal to 2.7. That is if there is no given PSI and TSI in the problem. So lastly, we have your M sub R or the soil resilient modulus of the subgrid, which will reflect the engineering property of the subgrid or the layer just above our sub-base. So, for all agencies, or for some agencies, they do not use the modulus or resilient modulus, but instead, they would be using the CBR or the California Bearing Ratio, which is defined as the ratio of the load-bearing capacity of the soil to the load-bearing capacity of high quality aggregate multiplied by 100. So if the CBR is less than 10, then we use the equation for MR as 1,500 times CBR. Okay? For CBR, we'll be discussing this further in the next module. So, as we have said, for flexible pavement, the controlling factor now is the thickness of the layers, which is defined by the structural number. 
So this equation now, or the SN now, will have an equation so as to relate the individual thickness and the individual material type of the pavement. So for the structural number, we can compute this using the equation given A1, D1 plus A2, D2, M2 plus A3, D3, M3, where in 1 represents our wearing surface, 2 represents the base, and 3 represents the subgrade. So for A, that will now be the structural layer coefficients of your wearing surfaces, base and subbase. Then we have D, which is the thickness layer, which is measured in inches. And then we have M for the base and subbase, which is the drainage coefficient. For your structural layer coefficient E for each layer, we use this table. So depending now on the layer, for each layer, they will be made up of different materials or component. So if it's, let's say it's a wearing surface, and it's given that we are going to use a sand mix asphalt concrete, then we are going to use a coefficient of 0.35. So if it's a different material, then we use a different coefficient. Okay? So if we are going to use the same material, hot mix asphalt concrete, for example, notice that for each layer, it will have different coefficient. So you have to take note of the layer and the material so as to get the correct coefficient. Okay? And then we have this stable for our reliability. So to get the value of ZR for the reliability of 950 to 99.9, .9, these are the value of ZR. And these values, if note, are all negative values. So how we do we how do we use this table? So let's say we have a reliability of 90. Then our ZR will be negative 1.282. A reliability of 75 will give us a ZR of so 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75. So a 75 reliability will give us a Z sub R of 0 0.675. Okay. So for the uh, Ashto rigid pavement design procedure, well, this will be based on the selected reduction in the serviceability and is likewise similar to the procedure for flexible pavements. So the only difference here will be the measure of strength. So for flexible pavements, we it is now dependent on the structural number, which is based on the thickness of layers and the materials used for each layer. While for rigid pavements, for our design, we are going to depend it on the thickness of the PCC slab. To determine the thickness of the rigid pavement PCC slab, we now follow the rigid pavement design equation, which is almost similar to that of the flexible pavement design equation, there will just be some changes. Okay, so we have log of W18 is equal to ZR times S sub O plus 7.35 log of D plus 1 minus 0 0.06 plus log of delta PSI over 3 all over the quantity 1 plus 1.624 times 10 raised to 7 all over the quantity D plus 1 raised to 8.46 plus 4.22 minus 0.32 
SI times the log of the quantity SC CD times the quantity D raised to 0.75 minus 1.132 all over the quantity 2.15.63 J times the quantity D raised to 0 0.75 minus 18.72 all over the quantity EC over K raised to 0.25. So for our variables for the rigid pavement design equation, we as well have W18 or the 18 hip equivalent single axle load. We have the ZR, which is also the reliability, S sub O, the overall standard deviation of the traffic. D is the PCC slab thickness measured in inches. The TSI, which is the pavement terminal serviceability index. Delta PSI, your loss in serviceability. S sub C is your concrete modulus of rupture measured in pounds per square inches. CD is your drainage coefficient. J is the load transfer coefficient. E sub C is your concrete elastic modulus measured in pounds per square inch. And we have K, which is the modulus of subgrade reaction measured in pounds per cubic inches. So, as you can see, some of the variables for rigid pavement design equation is the same as for the flexible pavement design equation. So, ang nadagdag lang will be the highlighted variables, the D, the S sub C, C sub D, J, E sub C, and K. Wherein, D, your PCC slabs thickness in inches. ST or the concrete modulus of rupture is the measure of the tensile strength of concrete. So in the problem, kung hindi given na modulus of rupture at ang nakalagay is tensile strength of concrete, then that will also be your S sub C. So by ESTM C78 or the flexural strength of concrete, we attain S sub C to a value of 500 to 1,200 PSI. So, in our class, if there is no S sub C given or modulus of rupture given, then we use 1,200 PSI. But unless given, then we use 1, 2. And then we have your CD, the drainage coefficient where it accounts for the characteristic of the subgrade in terms of its drainage capacity. And for a good condition or drainage condition, the value now of CD will be 1. So if in the problem, it states that the layers will have a good drainage condition, walang number na binigay, then automatic C sub D is equal to 1. Then we have G, the load transfer coefficient, which is a factor used to account the ability of the pavement to transfer load from one slab to another. The typical design of pavement with dowel bars will be at 3.2. So kung walang binigay ulit na given sa problem for the load transfer coefficient, then on the automatic value of J will be at 3.2. Then we have E sub C, which is the concrete elastic modulus, or also the Young's modulus, which has a typical value for PCC of 3,000 to 7,000 PSI. So kung walang given na EC, let us use the value of 7,000 PSI. And then lastly, we have K, which is the modulus of subgrade reaction 
which is measured in pounds per cubic inches, which will be dependent on several factors such as the omega and the rho. So for key values, this is usually given in the problem. Okay, so that's it for the overview and concept of pavement design for flexible and rigid pavements. So thank you for listening. So for our next lecture, we are going to discuss some examples involving the design of